What's good, y'all? Welcome back to the Onyx Report, where we as black men seek to uplift black men and boys using critical analysis. Hope you guys are well. Appreciate y'all for coming through. Shout out to Donnie, first one in the building. Shout out to Mark, CR Frank, Spain Man, Keith. Welcome to the Onyx Brotherhood. Busy Mike. Uh, shout out to Vanessa from the Virgin Islands. Uh, Barry, what's good? Rashid. Hope everybody's well. Um, you know, we're about to get this in, and I have a treat for y'all tonight because uh, we're going to actually delve into uh, Black Male Studies a little bit, and we're going to look at some of the people who are making some moves, um, shaking the tree, as it were, and creating new knowledge um, in a field that we've been talked about in, but um, one could debate how much, you know, impact we've had directly and opportunity to speak. So, couple of brothers in here that uh, I'm real happy to have on. They've both been guests on the show before, so uh, they are always welcome back. But let me go ahead and bring them up. Now we can dive right in. There we go. So we got, hold on, a good Dr. Travis Hood scholar. Let me put the, let me put the names up so folks can see. Um, uh Dr. Hood Scholar Harris and Dr. Oshan Gadsden. These brothers have definitely both been kicking down doors, whether you know it or not, but I'm allow them to introduce themselves. So um, let's go ahead and start with the Hood Scholar and then we'll go to Dr. Gadsden. Hey, what's up, what's up, what's up, y'all? It's funny because I kind of feel like family. I feel like a lot of people know me already. But for the <laughs> broader audience, for the new audience, what's up? I'm Dr. Travis Hood, Scarlet Harris, Hood Scholar, because I'm a scholar from the hood. I grew up in Holland Park, Richmond, Virginia, 804, survived the jungle, and I got a PhD. That's, right. um, that's the Hood Scholar, and yeah, I'm a professor, um, freedom fighter, and most important thing I want y'all to know about me is I love our people, I love black people, and I want black people to get free. Okay, can you, can you tell them where you're teaching these days? What's up? Oh man, yeah, I'm teaching, man. I'm teaching in a couple of universities. <laughs> um, William and Mary and Hampton University. All right, all right, appreciate that. Go ahead and have Dr. Oshan Gaston introduce himself, and I want him to give you the new credentials. Give this humble introduction, brother. I want the full one. Go ahead. I appreciate it, brothers. I'm happy to share a stage with you both again. Uh, I'm Dr. Gaston, applied psychologist. Uh, PhD in uh, counseling psychology. Uh, I am currently uh, the department chair of the Department of Psychology at Hampton University. Uh, and uh, well, I also teach some uh, courses for Howard University as well this semester. Uh, I am, as I mentioned, a uh, scholar practitioner. Uh, in addition to scholarship around Black masculinity, emotional intimacy, and anxiety, I also treat uh, black men, black boys, and have done so over the last uh, 17 years. And so I'm just happy to be here with these brothers. Looking right. forward to a great conversation. And I, and I should also say both of them are active and, and, and participatory fathers. So don't get it twisted. We are grown ass black men in the academy doing this work on multiple levels. Um, now, Dr. Harris hit me up first about this. So why don't you kind of introduce for people what we're talking about tonight and what's going on. <clears throat> yeah, so shout out to Jono Lockhart, um, David, say SYBM, a couple of other dudes. Like I got a big response from, a big response on social media between Facebook and Twitter after mm -hmm. we put out this special issue. And the fellas was like, look, you gotta break that down. You gotta, you gotta break it down and, and talk about it live. So I was, so yeah, I wanted when, hit, when I hit you, Hassan, I was like, yo, I want us to talk about it. The dope mm -hmm. part is, Hassan well, is here with us too. Yeah. So um, I think we can also get in the background of this because, and I'll, and I'll let Hassan jump in next, but what happened was I reached out to Hassan like three years ago. It actually was years ago because the plan originally was for this to be a book. Mm. And then 2020 hit, bam, COVID. Right. So COVID kind of messed up the rotation, right? And then I was like, yo, will we do a special issue? But the reason why I wanted the initial um, desire for doing this, this work 
was as I was studying, as I was doing as a scholar, right? As, as many of us, just like you have signed, we talked about this. As I was going through grad school, whenever it came to gender, whenever it came to um understanding sexuality, it was always about black women or LGBT BQIA folks, mm -hmm. right? But there was not, I didn't really see a very in-depth analysis of black men. Right. And so then as I study more, I was like, you know, let me look more and more into this. And as I look more and more into this, it wasn't just in areas of gender sexuality. It was pretty much across the board. Yeah. And I was like, yo, like people ain't really talking about us that much. Mm. So I, so shout out to actually, I did find the places I did find it was in psychology and education, right? Okay. Psychology and education, I was like, okay. Some psychologists and education scholars they talk about us mm -hmm. for the people who were, but other than that, it was it was pretty absent. Like I'm like, dang. So then that's when I hit up um O'Shawn's like, yo, we got to do something about this. Okay, well, for, uh, shout out to Ian in the chat for dropping the information. We always appreciate that. Like, share, subscribe, join, and donate support the show if you will, so I can continue to bring you independent black male thought. But uh, Dr. Gadsden, weigh in on this. Where you know. Tell <laughs> how you come in on this and how it came to be man <clears throat> travis is right <clears throat> um yeah we had we had so many different ideas of where to publish this and mm -hmm. then the pandemic hit uh and we um i was hit up actually by another good brother dr james wadley a uh, wadley mm -hmm. uh at lincoln university is a cheer there uh in their counseling department and great brother who created a journal many, many years ago called the Journal of Black uh, Sexuality and Relationships. And he said, we need a special issues. Uh, do you have something? Can you have some brothers that will put something together? I was like, yes, we do. We have an mm -hmm. idea already. And so let me um, see what Travis thinks about it. And so we agreed and we, you know, we already had a call. And so we just re-edited the call, obviously changing it from a book at, th at that point, because we were still thinking about writing a book. Uh, so be on the lookout for that. Uh, but we wanted to do what we could in the moment. Yeah. And that's where the special issues came. We wanted to look at, uh, really uh, examine and explore black masculinity from multiple disciplines. Mm -hmm. uh, and to really, and to really uh, give voice to Although we did have some women scholars who did add uh, to some of, uh, I think there was one article by one woman scholar. We wanted to try our best to have uh, at least 90 something percent of the articles mm -hmm. and special issues be written by black men. And it was. Okay. Um, and so, yeah, that's how the issue came to be. Oh, you guys, I don't know. I don't know if I discussed this with either one of you, but you guys gave me a lot of um, a lot of hope in a particular way because a lot of people don't know i stopped i stopped publishing years ago i really did i mean i just stopped altogether, and that's one of the things that brought me to youtube and i started the television channel but my whole thing was i was writing and you know i kept hitting editors that just didn't want to they didn't want to touch none of this and so i got to the point where it was like you know what i got to find my own lane because i want to talk about the things i want to talk about and i don't like to be bullied i don't respond well to being locked out. Uh oh, so um, you know when you guys reached out and said, "Hey, man, you want to publish something with us?" I had articles just sitting on my hard drive. I mean, I probably uh, I probably got about two books worth of stuff just sitting on my hard drive. So it was like until you guys said something, it was like it didn't dawn on me that there was now a space where black men could actually engage other black men on issues of gender, sex, race, the whole deal. And actually, you know, engage topics that in other spaces, you know, might be considered risque and we don't, we, you know, we don't know if we want to talk about it. You guys welcomed it. Yeah. So I think you opened up a whole nother lane. And I'm, I'm not saying there's a lot of brothers out there that just stop publishing like me, but there's probably a lot of brothers in the academy that, you know, really don't know where they can actually go full steam ahead and, and research and talk about the things that they're really interested in. Because there's not a lot of spaces that that will really want to hear black male voices to that extent. Yeah, talk a little bit about the feedback you got from people who responded to the call. Want to hit that, Travis? First, yeah. So, um, yeah, it was huge, right? <laughs> and I and going off what you were saying, I suspect it was like, yo, finally, we got people who's ready to publish our stuff. 
-hmm. right? So we, um, man, it was, <laughs> it actually, it, it, now that I'm remembering, thinking back to it, it's both good and bad, right? Because mm -hmm. we, we got a lot of, we got a lot of submissions, probably over 20, good. right? So one hey was dope because there was great interest. A lot of people um, had the opportunity to write. But on the other hand, and Oshawn, you probably remember this too, there was it, there was this sense of it doesn't take much to write about black men. Oh wow! Okay, you remember that, Oshawn? Yeah, I, I mean, you know, um, I like to tread this very lightly, <laughs> but uh, some of some of the submissions, uh, I don't know. They it didn't give a lot of thought. Some of the authors didn't give a lot of thought to what they were writing. They certainly did not abide by the call. Mm. Uh, they, they didn't answer some of them they didn't answer any of the questions uh then there were some who you know uh had some agendas that were actually adverse to the spirit and the tone of the special editions at least in my mind and travis's mind wow and so yeah there was a lot of um i don't know i don't want to use the word correction but a lot of uh, feedback Mm -hmm. that we tried to, to give to authors about really thinking more deeply about their submissions because for us they were just really i don't know uh big abstracts okay. <laughs> there, there yeah. was really not a lot of okay lot of, uh, let, and let me jump back in and and so i can be very clear so this is doesn't get into any of the subjectivity and all the other stuff when i'm talking about art the the the, the components of an academic article right when you have an academic article you need to have some type of historiography you need to have methodology you need to have um sources primary research mm -hmm. um all of these things need to be properly laid out right and then and then cohesively cohesively put together in such a way right. that is publishable by a peer-reviewed journal right and so what i'm saying is and a lot of the submissions didn't have those components so mm. this is so this is a, this and so it's two things right or one this is a very objective measurement of a scholarly article right so it's not me saying oh they i disagree with them any of that stuff so people can't even go in that right that's mm -hmm. number one but number two it's like why is it and this is the question for us to consider why is it that a chapter or a, a scholarly article for black men why would you submit something that doesn't have all the components of it mm. to a call right okay. now if you because we did get grad students right grad students I'm, I'm not mad at them right because they're still learning the whole process i because i remember being a grad student and i had to learn how to go through and write an academic article i'm mm. not mad at them for that but if you are an assistant professor who has published before you recognize the what it takes to get published and you don't give those same precedents and credence to what you're submitting that's what i'm saying look we got to keep that same energy okay so i'm curious are, so are we saying there was a range okay so out of those who who responded but didn't quite meet the call was it a range of responses from people who didn't really know how to write in this area all the way to people that had nefarious and questionable agendas or, or like, how would you how would you frame that? Yeah, I think all of the above. I mean, you know, I think uh, we had some authors who had written something already. That, okay. And it was like they were trying to uh, make it fit. Uh, but when we gave them feedback around, well, okay, your your results actually are sort of um, antagonistic <laughs> against mm. the very mm. subject matter. You know, mm. might you know, might you reconsider? We got a lot of pushback. We had some authors who were writing from a feminist perspective, and I remember, you know, Travis and I went back and forth about this, and I was saying, okay, I don't mind. I mean, you know, we want various disciplines to mm. to to you know articulate their vision, but it has to be. We we wanted them to um, expand, critique feminism or feminist theory within the context in which they were writing. Okay. uh around black masculinity and they mm -hmm. you know they refused you know they were wow. this, is, this is it and you know so you know it ranged the range yeah. was from folks who didn't know how to write 
or were in the process of learning how to write. Mm -hmm. uh, for those who uh, whose agendas were just antagonistic against the call and were, you know, and we're not open to that, you know, to the feedback that Travis and I gave. You know, Travis gave a lot of, you know, you know, he gave a lot of great feedback, detailed um, feedback. and very detailed feedback. Mm. And, you know, people, you know, decide some people decided not to because we gave them the, the opportunity to to resubmit. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And there were some people who were just like, this is too much. And it's like, oh, this is too much. You know, from Travis's perspective, from a psychodynamic perspective, we wonder about sort of like what's behind that psychologically, like, you know, writing about black men you know, why should it be a burden? It should be written, you know, with thought, with intentionality, you um, know, anyway, yeah. No, no, I, I hear what you're saying because I've seen this take place at academic conferences too, where you have the, the idea is on, on the one hand, we really know all there is to know about black men. There's really nothing new, you know, <laughs> like we, all we gotta do is talk about prison, maybe talk about drug dealing and, you know, with it, and I've seen this. You know, I, I, you know, I've actually seen a presentation uh, one person gave where, and this was a professor. She said, all we really need to know about black men has already been covered in the film Boys, the, Boys in the Hood. Okay, okay. So that's, that's it. I mean, she was presenting this at a conference a few years ago. That's all we need to know. And wow. so you have that on one end. And then on the other end of the spectrum, there's this kind of idea that um, feminist theory, black feminist theory is enough to study gender and sexuality across the board and really, it's the only thing, and there's nothing else to really be considered if you're a serious scholar, but Black feminist theory. Did you guys get that sense that there was that, that idea there? Yeah, uh, let me jump in on this one, because this really came up when it, when it comes to method, right? Mm -hmm. So for, for the non-academic listeners, listeners um, to this show, in academia, we have this notion of method and methodology. And a very basic way of understanding method is what approach are you taking mm -hmm. to understand what you're studying, right? So uh, a method, different types of method could be archival research, um, interviews, oral histories, looking at actual data, right? Mm -hmm. and, then, and now since we do interdisciplinary transdisciplinary studies, it's like, okay, looking at archive research, interviews, and data, right? Mm -hmm. And what was happening in his submissions, and, and this is the thing, this is the problem we had with, with from the feminist piece on, is like their method, their method was lacking. Mm -hmm. And usually what happens, right, with a lot of with a lot of research on black men, people are looking to prove what they already think is true. Confirmatory mm -hmm. bias, yeah. Okay. So it's like, I already think this about black men. So since I already think this about black men, let me research what I already think. And if you wow. take that approach, then how can you actually right. be open to learning something new? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, one of the things that was said earlier in the chat uh, a couple of different times is that, you know, a lot of research uh, lends itself to future policy. Did you guys see this? And I, you know what? Let me put this on the screen real quick so people can can actually see what we're talking about. Uh, look at the journal that you guys put together, right? So the Journal of Black Sexuality and Relationships, right? Um, you can see there a special issue, Decolonizing Masculinity, Oshan D. Gadsden, PhD, guest editor Travis T. Harris, PhD, along with co-guest editor James C. Wadley, PhD editor. Right. So, you know, when you guys put this together, were you actively thinking about the way this might impact policy later or were you just focused on, you know, really kicking the door down with this issue and really kind of uh, inaugurating a, a hopefully a new kind of conversation about black men? You want to go first, Ocean? Or you want to yeah, I, I wanted I was thinking of this as and you know, we, we've revisited this uh, amongst ourselves. I was looking at this as the first stage to okay. a, a movement um, and uh, a, a consistent movement uh, where we um, uh, center of some sort, whether it's virtual or physical or in both, where we disseminate 
uh, multiple ways of knowing uh, mm -hmm. related to black masculinity through scholarship and of course, from a practice perspective, through community engagement with black men uh, from a mental health perspective, sociological perspective. I just envisioned all sorts of a multidisciplinary and space where scholars meet community, community meets scholars around issues related to black masculinity. So this to me was the starting point of the conversation of inviting folks from multiple disciplines to talk about their um, fantasies, ideas, perceptions, perspectives on black males. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so that's how I saw the work and how I continue to see the work. I mean, the, the, the process of decolonization, as all of you brothers know, is an ongoing continual process. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it's ever going to be done. And there's so many components uh, of our minds and of our lives uh, that have to be decolonized, particularly around Black you know, particularly thinking about black males. So I really saw this as a starting point, a launching point to a larger conversation and initiative and movement. Okay. Um, yeah, I feel like he covered it pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> let's let's look through uh, some of the contributions. Uh, you guys are open to kind of talking about yeah. some of this. Uh, let's start with the first couple on the screen. Any Anything you want to tell people about? Yeah, so that's the one um Oshan and I wrote. Um and for that one, just this is just normal for inter for special issues to have an opening article that lays out the, the special issue and the field. And um what we really did is is we did both, we did multiple things, right? One, well, Sean just laid out, right? Lay, laying out, okay, this is the beginning. Now, now we need to start thinking about how can and, and and let me say it this way. When we made our original call, this goes back to method of theory. We wanted a transdisciplinary approach to the study of black men. Okay. What is transdisciplinary? Let me break that down because some people might not know what it means. Usually, right, when I started off, we talked about how uh, education scholars may have looked at black boys in school. Right, mm -hmm. or how a psych a psychologist how psychologists um have looked at black rage and um the way black men are 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 treated and their response to um living here in this country. Okay. And and so the next step will be an um interdisciplinary or multi multidisciplinary um approach to studying anything, but in this sense, black men. And an interdisciplinary approach is okay. What happens when an education and a and a, a education scholar looks at black boys, but also includes psychology, right? So, and so that's you can think about that as interdisciplinary, and and, more, and then you can say, what if an education scholar looks at black boys and a psychologist look at black boys? Then it's these two disciplines are looking at them. That's multidisciplinary. Now, transdisciplinary. There's all of that, right? And more in the sense of we're looking at you, the person, the person who's trained, mm -hmm. such as that's all three of us, right? We're all interdisciplinary trained scholars. So okay. we can bring an interdisciplinary trained lens together and have it so that it's implemented, right? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's there's a difference between just looking at black men. For the sake of looking at black men, then what we were saying is we want because you're ethnic studies, right? Were you only were you American studies, Dr. John? So I'm trying to remember. Oh, my doctorate was in cultural studies, but I got cultural three studies. degrees in Africana, and I teach in Africana studies. Right. So your cultural study Africana. I, I was my PhD is in American, and I'm Africana. Uh, Oshan is psychology in Africana, right? Mm -hmm. So all three of us together. Looking at black men across multiple yeah. lenses and disciplines, and then coming up with actual tangible both outcomes and actions that can be implemented for black men. Okay. So that's what a, a transdisciplinary approach, and that's why you can see now, right, when we looked at some of these um earlier um submissions that we rejected, is just that you weren't going in that direction. Mm, okay. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Uh, and, oh, I was going to say that the in the article or really the editorial that Travis and I wrote in that he did a beautiful, oh, my God, he did a masterful job of uh, really looking at the historical uh, underpinnings of black male studies um, from multiple disciplines uh, and really talk, really uh, sharing, well, really articulating and really postulating the need for, like really giving a rationale of the need for not only our uh, special issues, but this ongoing conversation. And in the article, excuse me, in the editorial, I also provided what I like to call black male uh, uh, research paradigm, you know, decolonized mm -hmm. research paradigm, mm -hmm. where I submit uh, a number of suppositions and ethos that should always be the framework of any scholar, regardless of discipline, in terms of how they approach, we talk about methodology and intentionality, how they approach working with, researching, collaborating with Black males. And so that editorial, if you have a chance to read it, it is really dope. And it is theoretical, but it also uh, allows you within the context of your discipline to make use of it, uh, you know, in that, in that way. Can you pull it up real quick, Oshan? So you can, I'm sorry, um, Hassan, so you can see. What do like, you mean? Well, you want me to click in it? Yeah, click on view because you'll be able to see. Oh, um, okay. It's right at the beginning. Uh, hold on. Is that where you want to be? Yeah, keep going. Keep going. Bring on. Okay. Keep going. Keep going. Uh, oh, is it not letting you see it? I mean, oh. it, this is what I'm seeing. Oh, there so, it is. That's not the full article. Oh, oh. did you send him the act? The, the, the... I'm gonna send you the oh, okay. You know what? I'm gonna send you the um, the I put it on academia. Okay, I'm gonna send that to you. Send me the link for that. All right, yeah, all right. So while we kind of go through that, um, you know, we can just kind of sift through some of the different pieces. Do you have uh, well, let's talk about your piece, brother. Come on now. I want you. <laughs> come on. I just, you know, I want, but you know, some of these titles are incredible. You know, I want you guys to check this out. I put the link in the chat for those of you that might be interested um, in delving into this. Um, I contributed a piece: uh, Is anti-black misandry the new racism? And these brothers were, uh, you know, kind enough to pull it in and engage it. And like I said, man, this is not. You you can't assume that any piece, any journal, even any book is going to allow you to engage these kind of questions because there really are, um, you know, entrenched kind of viewpoints about black men. Mm -hmm. There's an idea that there's only one way to, to adequately and, and properly talk about black men. And a lot of it comes from this kind of detriment model, right? Where, you know, black men have to be talked about in terms of the negative impact they have on other demographics. But if you actually take the position that black men are human beings, for one, that need to be actually studied from a position of uh, what I would call good faith, you know, where we're actually exploring black male humanity without this kind of, you know, assumptive idea that they have to fit into some kind of pathological framework, you'd be surprised how that subtle switch right there is enough to keep, um, you know, keep people out of publishing in a number of different spaces. So, you know, you're asking about this question of misandry. Now, I've had plenty of people tell me misandry doesn't exist. There's no such thing as misandry. There's misogyny, but there's no such thing as misandry. Uh, and, and, and especially no such thing as a misandry toward black men. You know, and so there's the, you know, you, and these will be, these are, these are colleagues in the academy, not just, you know, talking heads on Twitter or whatever. Um, so, you know, you can't assume that you can have these conversations anywhere. And that's one of the things I really wanted to thank you both for doing is creating this space that allows for, you know, a more nuanced and subtle discussion about black men that allows it and, and includes more about our experiences. Yeah. Um, oh, and sees us as a full range human. Yes. 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 Yeah. And go, oh, go ahead. Oh, no, I was just going to piggyback on your point. I'm about to uh, to start a new study, a qualitative study, uh, narrative and phenomenological, looking at how black men in, uh, define joy and pleasure. Mm. And you would it's just to your point when I talk to colleagues about methodology and, you know, making sure that's straight, 
people still are like joy and pleasure. And they mm. all, and, and the first place they go is sexualization. And I'm like, no, I mean, we're gonna allow men to define it for themselves, but why is it that the assumption is that black men, when given an opportunity to talk about joy and pleasure, the first place they're gonna go is sex. Right. You know, so it is this this idea that we don't really have a full range of not just humanity, but spirituality. Absolutely. Um, and, and that has to be combated. Absolutely. Um, I, I sent wonder, you the link, FYI. Uh, how did you send it? I sent it on, on email and on messenger. Okay. You can put it in the private chat, but here, I'll just check it on email. Um, I'm going to work backward a little bit while I open up. Uh, hold on. Okay, so you just want me to open it here? Okay. Yeah. Go ahead and put it there and go ahead and bring it back up. Yeah, screen. that way. All right. Yeah. All oh right. my lord. They, everybody trying to make some money. <laughs> <laughs> you want me to you want me to download it or is is it opening up here? Oh, okay. Okay. There we go. There we go. Uh what do you want me to oh keep going? I just want you to get to the points that um Ashawn laid out. There they go. Okay. Yeah. All right. You want to take us through them? Yeah. So for some reason, it's not showing up clear on my screen. So let me just pull up the article. Um, all right. Normative research often misses full of nuance, misunderstandings. Normative research. Okay. So this is that first part is basically what we were just uh, already discussed, right? Okay. So go to the, um, keep going. Yeah. Here it goes. The Black Male Center Decolonial. Yes, that's it right there. Okay. That joint is fire. All right. You want to you want to take us through it? Um, Oshai, you started off because that's the part I can't even see it. I'm oh not... <laughs> okay, that this um I'm on the uh laptop. Oh, here we go. Okay. So given these assumptions, a black male centered decolonized framework must then work toward a visible and attainable praxis that is psychologically, culturally, and spiritually relevant to the complex needs of black males. The work with black males and the research that undergirds it must be one, political and spiritual in nature, offering a vehicle for black males to retrieve what they were and remake themselves. Two, offer a reflexive analysis that explores the multi-complex impacts that imperialism and colonialism, colonialism, excuse me, thank you, have had on how black males have under, have been understood, i.e. research questions, methodologies, measures, and study. Three, an implicit articulation of the history and impacts of Western research to the eyes of and via the voices of black males and black racialized male research researchers, clinicians. Four, by nature, resistant in action, resistance in action, a form of research that creates holistic counter narratives mm. about black males. Mm. And five, deconstructed by nature, analyzing the motivation and types of research questions developed in research projects focused on black males. Mm. Mm. I got chills with him reading that. Bro. <laughs> <laughs> so look at this, right? He's saying, look, black men are complex, mm -hmm. right? Not just like, even with the example he just gave, the first thing that came to, to joy and pleasure was sexuality. Right, right. Not spirituality, not, not having fun, not on a very basic level, kicking it with, with the boys, mm -hmm. right? Not just enjoying life, enjoying the weather. Because mm -hmm. these are when we start to talk about this, we're talking about the social, the socio emotional, um, historical, all these opponents that's coming together to make up who we are. Exactly. In the very in the very first call, right? Uh, we open up with this question. Are black men even black? Mm. Okay. Mm. Mm. Let me say that again. Are black men even black? Mm. Because if we black all it seemed like when we talk about blackness, and you get it this in your article, right? It seemed like when we talk about blackness, we understand how difficult it is for black people, right? Mm -hmm. We talk about the transatlantic slave trade. We right. talk about dispossession and colonization. Mm -hmm. We talk about how hard it is with uh, police brutality and, and the school to prison pipeline and all that. Mm -hmm. But some kind of way, 
this don't apply to black men right right, right. where right initially in the slave trade the majority of the enslaved africans were who mm -hmm. people don't talk about that but the first one were men <laughs> the majority, yes. majority of the slave were men yes 95 percent of people who, who died for police brutality are who men yeah. men yeah. the largest in mass in, in mass incarceration the largest percentage is who yeah men how you and, gonna say miss Sandra ain't, ain't real right right and so we're saying that these are the complex issues the intertwined issues and black men going through, and say the base way it got black men going through all this ish <laughs> then we need that type of response to yeah. that and that's what we're hoping that people will offer not just some straight like oh okay this is how i feel about black men this is the way black men are mm -hmm. right absolutely um hold on me we have some brothers in the chat one of them said, remember remember the brothers frolicking oh, challenge yeah right? and and the, and the whole you know and how that was treated right yeah right right yeah <laughs> you know the whole question of and it really came down to seeing black men outside of stereotype because i think this right. is what dr gaston was referring to a moment ago when the questions he got around the use of the word pleasure and joy came back to sexualization right mm -hmm. in, in, in much of the social imaginary we are you know uh, the hypersexualized phallus mm -hmm. mm -hmm. yeah humanity yep. It, it, outside yeah. of maybe violence, right? We're criminalized and violent, but you know those are the two modes that black men are most interpreted through. Mm -hmm. and, and and so even when you try to break out of that, the very first thing that somebody said, try to resituate black men back into a framework, we're trying to, to step out of. Mm -hmm. um, and this is in the, the academy. This isn't even just limited to popular culture or mainstream media. You know, we're talking about popular academic approaches to the, to the so-called study of black males this is where we still end up with having to fight against the tide of hypersexualization and criminalization mm -hmm. what you guys are doing are ground is groundbreaking for that alone mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. oh, Sean, i'm just curious what what inspired you <clears throat> to um to come up with this this framework well oh, okay i uh, because of everything we've been talking about, that first of all, uh, to me, from my from my ethic and uh, my work, that you know, uh, the work around black and minoritized folks, particularly black males, has to be social justice oriented, and has to and has to have an explicit uh, articulation of the ways in which the ecological uh, the ecological variables like oppression, racism, and sexism, genderism, uh, all the things that we encounter has to be a part of um, uh, creating new body bodies of knowledge. And so that was one of the first factors. The second factor is that um, most of what we were reading uh, in the psychological literature and, um, and other disciplines, of course, were always written about us mm -hmm. uh, right. and not right. written by us or right. through our lens or through the voices of black men or black men, of black males in particular. Mm -hmm. um, and so social justice, having a black focus, a black ethic, to me, um, are, are real components of those suppositions. I mean, I go on to make some more assumptions in, in this model, but for what we read, you can hear that there has to be a framework that um, explicitly resists and, and creates counter arguments and narratives uh, to what we have, you know, have ingested and internalized within the academy, but of course, within our own community on multiple levels. And so those are some of the reasons why I thought that this type of framework was more nuanced and, and particularly what was particularly helpful in helping researchers and clinicians, even before you get into your topic area or mm -hmm. trying to quote unquote help, are this is this a part of your ethos? Mm. Are you really trying to resist and create new counter narratives, right? Mm -hmm. 
Are you, are you looking at the nuanced complexity of black males? Um, are your research questions situated in a way that are already the meta communication of those research questions are already answers in and of themselves? Mm -hmm. You know, like I always use in my research methods course with students, this research question that is real. Mm -hmm. it's, it is, are black men more violent than white men? Mm. What kind of fuck? Oh, sorry. What kind of no, question? <laughs> like, like this is a real research question. Like, right. how problematic is that question on multiple levels? It makes right. so many assumptions mm -hmm. uh, about black men uh, and their propensity toward yada 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 yada. So, right. I think it. You know, we need people to not only understand, you know, the need for looking at the complexity, but to really check their research questions and hypotheses and make sure that they are not in and of themselves a perpetuation of deficient models and paradigms of black men. You know, Hassan, I want to jump in real quick just to say, let me let me explain the importance of this, right? So if if our healers are offering healing based on our caricatures, <laughs> then <laughs> what happens is what's being offered the medicine for example mm. can then be harmful yes oh yes so let me give you a very practical example about this right That's good. So there's there's multiple studies but there's a study on, on black men with depressive disorders mm. or black men with depression however you want to um qualify this right mm -hmm. and what and, and what this study did was it tracked how often clinicians and to be clear what clinicians are clinicians to be a therapist and a and a um in an office or even in a hospital, right? So the, how clinicians misdiagnose black men. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But then the problem is with their misdiagnosis, mm -hmm. when they when they offer um the quote unquote healing, then they'll tell black men, for example, hey, you need to stop doing drugs or you need to start smoking or you need to eat better. The problem is because it's based on the misdiagnosis, they are literally um trying to bring healing to the symptoms mm. right and mm. healing the symptoms only makes the problem worse right so now so what happens when they return to the office they say oh yeah i'm still caught up with whatever the habit whatever and all these are coping mechanisms right, mm -hmm. right, right whatever right. They, they still um deal with the coping mechanism what happens then they say they blame them and say, you are the reason why. You're resistant. You're resistant. Yes. You, you are the responsible <laughs> for the problems that you have. Mm -hmm. And so then it comes into, oh, we need to hold black men accountable. Right, 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 right. Whereas all of this started where, because you base all this on your caricature, on the stereotype that you created about him. Oh, yeah. yeah. So you don't even understand the pain that he's dealing with inside. You don't understand his depression. You don't understand all the things that are internally deep inside him that you're supposed to be doing as a clinician trying to bring out of him. Right. But you don't. But, like that. but you don't even think to add okay. on to that. You now you're preaching, brother. You don't. <laughs> these clinicians, you know, I've been training for a long time, and I I just, I just stopped training white clinicians. But these, mm. there are lots of them that don't even just like medical doctors. Don't even think we have pain. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So, so the diagnoses, you know, that they're giving and the interventions are based on their apathy mm -hmm. uh, and their apathetic stance toward our capacity around a full range of emotionality. And so, so there you get stigmatizing, punitive diagnostic yes. impressions yes. where medication or some sort of anger management, punitive mandated type of thing is needed mm -hmm. instead of more insight oriented, emotionally, spiritually inter, you know, uh, integrative uh, clinical care. So I'll give you mm -hmm. two examples. I was a postdoc in Philly and it was at, at a community based center and the way they had it was, you know, patients were seeing, you had to see a psychiatrist as, as well as a therapist. And so, but the, but the psychologist, me, had to sign off on the treatment plan. Mm. So the psychiatrist comes up to me. I had been seeing this black brother for probably six months. And he comes up to me. He says, you know, here's this new treatment plan. And I've diagnosed him with antisocial personality disorder. Now, 
maybe people don't know what antisocial personality disorder is, but you can just gather from the name, it's some heavy shit. And it has a lot of stigmatizing uh, qualities and components to it. And I said to him, I said, what do you mean? He's, I mean you've just seen him for 30 minutes, maybe not even 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. what, what do you mean? Well, this is what I've diagnosed. And I said, I've been with this guy for six months. Mm -hmm. He does not have antisocial personality disorder. Oh. And I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna sign off on it. So it went up to the main folks and supervisors, and I stood my ground mm -hmm. because but but even standing my ground as one person, you can imagine that is the standard practice. You can't imagine how many black brothers have been misdiagnosed in that yes. clinic alone and but put on medication and feel powerless because some of them were mandated to be there. Or they don't understand why they, you know, there's, there's there's economic resources connected to their treatment, and so they go along with it, and so you have a whole generations of, of black folks in general, but black males in particular, who are being treated in these community-based uh, uh, contexts, who are not really being treated. It's another form of social control. You know, there's a there's a paper that Dr. Tommy Curry wrote about eight years ago called, mm -hmm. um, I think it was called, uh, let me see, Black Studies, Not Morality. Mm -hmm. In that paper, you know, he kind of said what a, what a number of us were kind of thinking here or there, but you know, Tommy, he put it all together and threw mm -hmm. it at you. Like it was, mm -hmm. you know, and, and what he pointed out were the ways in which, you know, theory from within the field in many ways was causing a number of problems, one of which, and this is my, you know, my interpretation of his, of his argument, some of this pathologized black men in very particular ways. Mm. Now we fast forward and in the last couple of years alone, we've started to see therapists come mm. on social media, come on the television and, and, and most particularly, you know, feminist therapists yes. are participating in this pathologization, you know, pathology narrative for black men and a lot of it has been influenced by, you know, very particular type of pedagogy, you know, these arguments about, you know, especially if you look at the Duluth model, right? These mm -hmm. ideas are inherently patriarchal. They're black men in particular are inherently oppressive, inherently abusive. We're not going to look at the, the data around that. We're just going to make these kind of arguments. And, and, and now it's gotten to the point where it's in the public. It's not just, you know, kind of enclosed in these academic spaces it's being brought out on twitter where you have people who are trained clinicians with mm -hmm. degrees with certification who are getting on at night in their home saying <laughs> yes you know what i mean it's that it's become that brazen right how, how, how do you how do you respond so, to that can topic? i respond to that first mm -hmm. um what? and this is mm -hmm. i'm gonna try not to go crazy on this one because it pisses me off to think about it the most cited work on black men. Guess what that is? All right, go ahead. Do you know it already, Hassan? No, go ahead. Go ahead. No, you're Bell talking. Hooks. Oh, oh yeah. real cool. Okay, okay, okay. Let this sink in. Mm -hmm. The scholar who said that black men were involved. What did what she said? A ritual, a, a, a suicide ritual. Said a lot of shit. <clears throat> <laughs> let that sink in, bro. And she was talking about the Central Park Five, who are mm. innocent. Right. She said the Central Park Five was in, involved with suicide ritual. Her work is the most cited and most used text in academia to understand black men. Wow. And the, and the problem with that is what, Travis? So methodologically. <laughs> huh? Say that again. Uh, you can touch it. You can start methodologically with the problem with her stuff. Is. Right, right, right. One, yeah. Real quick, real quick. Oh. Shout, out, shout out to Dr. Ronald Neal. Oh, out to, Ronald Neal. Shout, shout, out to the, shout out to the Green Gorilla. Both of them are in the house. Uh, Yo, so, and and up, Ronald, Ronald is still in Africa, by the He's way. In Africa. Take he, me did with a, you, he did a video earlier today. If you haven't checked it out, go to the Dr. Ronald Neal channel. Check him out. You know, giving yeah. commentary about black men but what dr neil is doing is he's expanding the discussion by you know supporting the push for black men to travel to experience treatment in different situations different environments and to reflect on what exactly americanity is if you're experiencing this new experience out of the box out of america where you're actually being treated to varying degrees more like a human being 
Hey, well, shout out to Dr. Neil. Shout out. Um, but I didn't mean to interrupt. I just wanted to no, get that in. Go ahead. Yeah, so Bell Hooks, right? It, it seems like she's allergic to citations and footnotes. <laughs> no, she so is a citation. Like... <laughs> <laughs> bro, you read through her stuff. It's like, based on what? Yes. Based on what, bro? This is why we was talking about methods, because it's like, oh, you can just, I guess because Bell Hooks said it, it's true, right? So mm -hmm. one is, one is, the question is like, how do we know what she's saying is true? But two, because this is the most cited, right? This is and th this is considered an academic, a key, a seminal text in academia. Yeah. So for those outside of academia, if this is so, what happens is in academia, as the text becomes more popular, it gets more citations. As you get more citation, then it becomes okay. This is the go-to text. This is the standard. Yeah. This is the standard. Yeah. So now, all with all these people. Just like, and this is the other part, right? And, and and let me break down how this, and I talk about this in the um in the special issue, but this is how it works, right? Whenever you want to understand black men as an undergrad, you might take a couple of um uh, a gender women's gender and sexuality courses, right? Mm -hmm. And when you when you hear about us in those courses, then you only gonna hear about us as abusers, right? Right. So then when you go to grad school. You might specialize, and it's either we're either going to be abusers mm. or absent. Mm -hmm. So then, when you get out in the field, right, you literally have no in depth training of understanding black men. Mm. So then you say, I want to understand black men. What's the standard text? Bell hook. <laughs> but see, see how this works, right? But, they, but this is where it comes back. Remember what I was saying earlier on. There was a point where I literally stopped publishing because I would send things in and keep hitting the same wall. It was mostly editors who had identified as feminists. And because and if you question feminism or talk about black men in a non-feminist context in terms of gender studies, it wasn't considered viable. It wasn't, you know, so so if bell hooks is the standard, you can see how important y'all your journal is. Right, right. We're including black men that are operating outside of the framework that bell hooks is being used to represent right yes. and, and i would argue that there are probably a long list of brothers who over the decades you know because we know of the brothers that broke through on one level or another we know about the robert staples we know mm -hmm. about you know what i mean the jim sedaniuses we know about you know there were there were a number of brothers that broke through they didn't have a movement of mm -hmm. black men in the academy at their back but mm -hmm. they were able to put something on the record you know what I mean? To say we're here, we're studying this. The, the, the way it's being the way black men are being studied is not is not accurate. But we're, we're putting something on the book. So you can go find Staples in 1977. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Talking about it. black men in a way that, you know, you wouldn't you wouldn't find often. And, and there have been plenty since then. Uh, but like I said, they didn't have a movement. They didn't have a groundswell of support. Uh, publishing, you know, publishing was sporadic from here and there at times. Now we're in a moment where we're starting to see a push for black men by black men that I've never seen in my lifetime. <clears throat> I don't know the full extent of what it can be, uh, where it's going, so on and so forth, but it's happening. And mm -hmm. I think what you guys are producing is helping to expand that push further by creating a space that's safe, that allows for people to come in and seriously study black men while asking new questions to expand how that research is approached in the first place. So and um, I'm gonna jump in real quick, then let you go, Sean. Um, y'all look at the the um, the academia article so y'all can read this because all those scholars that Hassan is talking about is in that article. Okay. One I do want to point out is Madhu Bhuti, right? Okay. And in this and and this was written in 1990. And I told you about this when I was writing this, Hassan. But mm -hmm. he has this story of a black man being killed. Mm -hmm by a woman police officer mm. Mm. so let this think, let, like think about this right of course uh, think about this a book you think they're gonna let a story in the 1990s where it says that a, a woman police officer killed a black man get out there mm. Mm. they're gonna try to keep that in as much as possible right mm. but think about how this does to the narrative right think about when we think about these notions of of quote unquote patriarchy and and then and then and how people say Miss Andrew ain't real, 
-hmm. when the, the police officer who killed the black man was a black woman. Mm. That literally just flips the whole entire stratosphere of these of these conversations. And the other reason why this is important, right? And and this is goes back to what you were saying about feminism. It's very common. Let, let, let me let me let me say this. Academic academia is supposed to be a place of intellectual exchange. I this is what I think. And then somebody responds, this is what you think. What, what feminism has done has weaponized it so that if you provide a, a different perspective, then it's, oh, you're attacking feminism or you're attacking black women. No, we're just doing what's supposed to be normal for higher education. Like what, what would it look like if we always already always agreed on the same thing? How right. will we grow? How will we build? How will we help each other out. So all that we're saying is, okay, we're just doing a normal academic process. This is what you say about black men. Okay, we're adding to this conversation. And what we're adding to this conversation, there are times when women and queer folks are the abusers and times when black men are the victims. Yes. Right. Right. Which shouldn't be groundbreaking because it, <laughs> if you've paid attention in the black community, this is the reality of what we live, what we see. But strangely enough, what we actually live and see doesn't always translate in media. It doesn't always translate into the academy. And we just end up, you know, fighting upstream to make points that people live through every day. Every day. And, and you can't blame patriarchy as the, you know, black male patriarchy is always, you know, I have some women scholar friends who that's the that that's the root of it all. So everything proximally is about. Uh, black male patriarchy when most black men don't feel empowered at all for multiple reasons. Mm -hmm. Don't have power, don't feel empowered, don't feel engaged at all. Right. And so we have to speak to what that disconnect is about when I'm having man after man for 15 years walk into my office and either disempowered on his job or disempowered in his home. Right. Uh, but yet he is He's the patriarch. No, 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 no. We, we, this type of fast talking pedestrian scholarship has got to be resisted. And I right. think that we are on to something as brothers here and other brothers that we know who are part of this movement. We've got to keep talking. We've got to keep engaging. We've got to keep taking this needle to the next level and creating structures that live beyond us. Okay. Right. Right. It, it, it needs to happen. It's it's past due time that it does, because it's almost gotten to the point, in my humble opinion, where it's almost a religious argument hmm. that black men being studied, you know, in, in this kind of pathological fashion, fashion is somehow a social truth. It's somehow an accepted truth that we have to go with. And if you question that, then you're lacking as a as an intellectual, you're missing the point. You're missing something. If you don't accept this path a lot, this pathology argument, and I think it's reached that point. Because again, when I can see people at conferences who will get up and and really just talk off the cuff about black males, I attended a session some years ago uh, at the uh, National Council for Black Studies conference. And they had a they had a panel discussion on black boys and hmm. education, hmm. and it quickly went. Uh, as a matter of fact, they didn't produce any charts. They didn't put it. They they were talking about my cousin, sister, son. And he didn't feel like going to school. <laughs> Therefore, from that black, you know, black boys don't like school. And I'm sitting in the audience going, this passes for intellectual discourse about black boys because the bar is set so low. I mean, you, you, you know, what you guys talked about with Bell Hooks is part of that narrative. You, you, we can be talked about without citations. We can be talked about in terms of individual anecdotes. And this some, somehow says something about mm -hmm. black males as a group. You know, what I mean, that's that in and of itself is a problem. And when you have to fight upstream against colleagues, sometimes in your own department about raising basic questions as to methodology in regard to how black males are studied, that's a level of tension and stress that, that nobody wants to talk about. Yeah. And I'm curious on that panel, were there any black men? Uh, I'd say out of the seven that I saw, maybe two. And they, they spent most of it quiet. They spent most of the time uh, being quiet. <laughs> You know and so what, what I was going to say, I got two two things to follow up to that. One, this brings us back to our submissions, right? 
Because if they said that on a panel in front of everybody, yes. imagine what they said in the submissions that they gave us. Mm -hmm. Now, I have this story um, up on my Facebook page. And this is about um, this person went to this conference. And at this conference, this 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 professor um, did research. Well, I got to say, I, I didn't want to say the gender, but I got to say the gender. This black woman professor um, did research on child abuse. Hmm. OK. And if y'all know the data on child abuse, one of the highest uh, groups that abuse is black boys. Mm -hmm. So what happened was, and 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 it's a sad reality, but the people who who are doing the abuse are black women. Um. So during during her presentation, she primarily focused on the abuse of black girls. And somebody questioned her on it, and I think, and I, I guess they, the um, the way they asked the question, they asked it to the side, and she said that I wanted to. So I'm sorry. Somebody questioned her on it. She said, and asked, "Why didn't you talk about black boys mm. who have been abused?" And she says, "Yes, I am familiar. I yes, black boys being abused did come up in my study and my research." But I didn't want to talk to, about them publicly because I wanted to protect black women. What? So, wow. Wow. You know, she wanted to protect black women, even though her own research found that pretty much black women are abusing black boys. Wow. Check out Marlon in the chat. I'm a mental health clinician and college professor who is going through this currently in my wow. class. Thank you all for affirming that I am not crazy in my perception. Real <laughs> talk. Oh, That's no. why I'm up here on this screen because you get to the point where you're like, either I'm crazy or there's something going on. And and I just, you know, kind of kept pushing until I started to hear more brothers coming forward to say, no, I'm going through the same thing or I'm seeing the same things. Um, I did it. Now, speaking to your point, Dr. Harris, I did a show um, I want to say, uh, you know, seven, eight months ago, maybe uh, looking at the most recent 2020 child maltreatment report. Mm. And what that report revealed was absolutely what you said. Black males tend to be those that were uh, violated, if not, you know, killed to the greatest extent. And the primary caregivers were, the, were most responsible and primary caregivers in this context, of course, being mothers mm. and by race, by gender. These things were bared out in chart after chart after chart. So when we say that black boys are being violated in terms of abuse, we, we're, we're talking about this, you know, uh, empirically. This is not about, you know, I got a, I got a, I got a, 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 a some girl hurt me. Right. You know, 20 years ago. Us objective. I'm going to use my scholarship to get at all black women. No, this is what the data is saying. And yeah. if I can't reference the data, then what conversation are we actually having? And when you add on what Dr. Harris just mentioned in terms of this willingness to cover up what the data says to protect the image of something in an academic setting, then what are we really up against here? What are we really talking about, right, in this context? What's, what's really at heart? You know, when black male scholars are afraid to speak, yeah. to a number of them that will send me emails on the side saying, hey, I love what you guys are doing. I love what you're talking about. I, I particularly like this issue or that issue. I love I love this video, that video. But I wish I could say these things, but I can't. Yeah, I uh, you know I, I used to have my conversations. I don't know if you brothers remember on Facebook, and I stopped for that reason. Mm -hmm. uh, and one of the conversations where I was having, and I took a, just a curious positionality as I usually always do, uh, was around that report you're talking about. And I talked about is there a notion of toxic femininity or toxic motherhood. Wow. And, you know, based on those uh, those those stats that Hassan was just talking about, and, you know, my Facebook lit, you know, women, friends defriended me. I remember that, too. You know, <laughs> scholars, you know. I was like, oh, so black men can be toxic. Yes. And fathers can be toxic. Right. Uh... Right. But black women who primarily mother, they can't be. So I, I think what, what what I was hearing was, oh, when it's when it comes to black women, this is not the norm. They are out. Yeah, right, right, right. But right. when it comes to black men, it's innately a part of our personality structure. 
and, and, I, and you, I remember, let me just say real quick to, to those who don't know, he didn't make any type of accusations. He didn't make any claims. He didn't. Only thing he did was presented the information and ask questions. But but the the crux of what he's talking about here, though, is that if this if black men have become the face of abuse, whether it's it's the abuse of uh, intimate partners or children, but the data shows that they're not, then. You know, at what point do we actually really? And I've had these debates where I've had people say, "Well, I don't trust the data." Okay, <laughs> you know, I get it. Okay, so you don't trust it. All right. So my question then becomes, what do you propose we use instead of data that keeps us from falling into stereotype anecdotes? You know, what 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 do you? Because I'm okay, fine. The data is questionable. Well, they only had three thousand in that sample. Okay, fine. What do you propose we use? Well, I, I, well. I, you know, uh, my sister's son. You know, he 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 likes going to school, and uh, you know. so yeah. until you have an alternative yeah. that that meets some kind of muster, I'm gonna go with what can be referenced. Because here's the thing: if the data is wrong on a given report or questionable, that's what scholars do. We argue about right. how the report was done, what's missing, what should have been covered. That can be referenced. That can be challenged. That can be interrogated. We got something to work with. But if we don't have any data, then yeah. we're really going with your opinions. We're going with your childhood experiences that you haven't processed. We're going with whatever pops in your head at a given moment. And when it comes from somebody who's lettered and in a position of authority, mm -hmm. that word is gospel. Mm -hmm. You have folks out there referencing and citing you just because you have a degree, but what you're saying has no basis in anything beyond your own personal issues. Mm -hmm. You know, so, so when I push for this, you know, that, that's one of the reasons that I took to, to Tommy so well, because, you know, dealing with uh, being an empiricist, that was the question he was always asking. What is this measured against? Where does this come from? What are we looking at as a standard to make sense of this? That wasn't the tradition, I, I'm sad to say, of Africana studies that I, I came up in. What I came up in was far more the humanity side of it. Well, you know, it was a lot of literary kind of arguments about meaning. But when that transferred over to perspectives on black men, there were no checks and balances against where people took those arguments. Mm. And again, I come back to why this journal is so important, because you guys are asking different questions and you have a standard, you know, of what is a credible research argument and how that argument is produced and, and where it goes. There's a, you, there's a context for that. So, you know, I applaud you all. And I will say, though, Africana was doing the work in the 80s and 90s, right? Mm. So we got an interview in there with Naeem Akbar, nice. um, which if y'all get a chance, y'all got to look it up. Because mm. um, cause he actually said the Million Man March was a success, mm. right? And mm. in the sense of he was fighting, he was pushing back against a lot of the narratives where um, people, well, mainly academics, who were just speaking out against the Million Man March. Okay. As in, black men don't have a need or an issue or anything that we need to address. Right? So to give people, if the, the interview gives more details about this, but the, the, the goal of the Million Man March was to, to, to zero in, focus in on the particular issues that black men dealt with. Okay. Right? Right. And so... The, this actually came out of, um, so Naeem Akbar and a group of scholars, both is a, is a combination of scholars and community members, actually started meeting in the mid-80s. Mm. And they were having conferences and coming together. It was like, look, they recognize, and this is the problem, y'all. This is why this is so frustrating. They recognized this way back in the 80s. Mm. Uh, Mahabudi um, book was titled, Are Black Men Obsolete? Mm -hmm. They were talking about the, the dangers and the extensions of black men dealing with way back in 1988 and 1992. Mm -hmm. So, but what they did was it was like, look, they were actually meeting to organize. And then eventually they actually had conferences. Mm -hmm. So they had conferences in the late 80s, um, early 90s. And then when we get to 92, we get um, African-American male studies. Whenever you do that, Dr. Yazdin, it, it, it impacts the sound. Okay, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Well, go ahead, uh, Dr. Harris. Rep repeat what you were saying, please. Um. So what happens was in the early 90s, 
we get the rise of this 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 field called african-american male studies mm. so there was this energy growing 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 by the time we get to 95 96 gone mm-hmm. so I, we need to do follow-up interviews with majors and gordon to find out what happened um and i found some of them they still trying to do the work mm-hmm. but it's like it got shut down and, and wow they had wow. a couple of issues for the journal the journal is no longer existing mm-hmm. and i'm like damn Tracy, like what happened mm-hmm. but but we do know like with mother booty what they they were talking of they were doing that work and they were spitting the truth right so um unfortunately they got they got we can say they got censored and silenced wow wow yeah and that's one of the reasons that this work has to be done publicly it has to be done um it, it, you know in the in the eyes of the people because especially you know pre-internet you know it's it's, it's hard to keep things out in public right. for people to engage on a regular basis but we got to make as much noise as possible while doing this research and keep the information out there because you're right. You know, you never know uh, what what kind of issues will be put forth to eliminate people from the discussion. You know, I mean, there's a reason so many black scholars are silent, black male scholars in particular. I don't like it, but I understand it. Mm. You no. Know, and and, and it, it, it requires that we learn how to be vocal. We develop a vocabulary, which is another issue. Another reason I salute the journal one of the things I've been saying for years is if we're going to do this work, we need to create a new bo- vocabulary that allows for the black male experience to be, you know, examined in detail because a lot of the conceptual, you know, terms and concepts that are already there don't really lend themselves to the black male experience as easily. You know what I mean? Um, and I'm referring here to inter- intersectionality and other mm-hmm. concepts. They come in with a predisposition about black male privilege, black male, you know, these kind of ideas that don't necessarily empirically bear out, but they're treated as truths at this point. So black, you know, this black male studies push hmm. has to be able to, you know, take on the work of creating what isn't there for men to, for us to be, better explain the experiences of boys and men in ways that that actually reflect their humanity. Yes. And engage the human experience that these black men are having rather than this, you know, this pathology that we got to keep, you know, coming back to because it's so pervasive. Yeah. And not just recognizing their humanity, but possibilities. Absolutely. What, what's next? What what can we do? What what's the what, what, what how can we expand? What's what you know, what's the range of where we can go? Mm-hmm. That that's really missing from the literature, you know, particularly psychological literature. Absolutely. You know, interventions for black boys and you know, are really mandation and things that, that to me are just another form of social control, yeah. but not really helping black boys and black men uh, tap into their creativity, tap into their power. You know? Yeah. I'm, I'm curious about something uh, for both of you. Um, the work you're doing now and the, the work you're putting out, what are the kind of responses you're getting from black males themselves? And, and, and how is it, kind of Im- impacting the work you're continuing to do. Uh, if you guys are willing to share some of that. Yeah, I mean, you know, um, my work with black males, uh, you know, take a clinical perspective. And so, uh, well, let me start with the class that I started teaching years ago, Psychology of Black Masculinity. And I think I want to bring that, that back in the fall uh, at Hampton. I'm teaching black psychology in spring, and I probably will have a, a strong focus on black masculinity in that class too. Mm-hmm. But of course, is when every time I teach it on a graduate or undergraduate level, obviously lots of black males take it, and black women, uh, and black males who take it have, you know, uh, reactions from this is helping me think about my father in new ways. I've gotten oh, yeah. more empathetic and grace, you know, extended more grace to him. Mm-hmm. Uh, got me looking at my own life. I'm, I'm back in therapy. Uh, just listening to you and, and refuting these things have been healing to me and my sense of identity. And then from a clinical perspective, you know, working with black males from, you know, all types of black men uh, that I usually work with. I don't work with adolescents much uh, these days, but uh, just having a space where someone who looks like them, who's not pathologizing them, who sit in the you know session and will curse with them, 
who will empathize with them, you know, um, who will allow them to, uh, to, to, to voice themselves and how they see their world mm. and uh, help them to shape it in ways in which makes sense for them without my own agenda. You know, mm. black males feel, uh, you know, uh, seen, feel mm. seen and heard and are able to do their work, quote unquote, whatever that work is for that particular black male. Right. In, in a way that is at their own pace, but most definitely always hearing in a way that they don't feel judged or stigmatized. So mm -hmm. that's, that, those are some of the things that I hear from some of the men that I you know, work with within the capacity of teaching those types of courses and in my in clinical work. Okay. Dr. Harris, what about you? Oh man, people eating it up, bro. <laughs> Well, and let me let me let me say this because you also have a foot in activism as well. So you're yeah. you know, so you know, talk a little bit about how black males are responding to you. Yeah, so it's it's great excitement. It's great excitement. Um people are are happy, they they they're they're hungry. Mm -hmm. I, I, a big a big synopsis is happy and hungry, right? Okay. They're happy that it's out there and they're hungry for more. So um, we, uh, O'Shawn and I got some things that we're working on in the pipeline. I should have talked to him. I don't know what we can say publicly yet in that, but um, we got some things that some some grants, some some stuff that we're working towards that um, that's going to be very practical, mm -hmm. right? Like you said, we we I'm on the activist, and O'Shawn is also a practitioner. We got things that we're going to be able to actually apply to um to black men. And let me say this: This is what I do feel public, feel uh, um, comfortable publicly saying. Going back to the situation of, I feel like it's clear now why we need this, right? So since it's clear, what we want to do is move towards offering pretty much a series, in a sense, uh, a reference guide, where you will not be able to make claims about black men. Yeah without referring, referencing this series. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so what I'm envisioning, right, is having scholars, because it's transdisciplinary, right? Mm -hmm. Having something for every single discipline mm -hmm. where if you want to talk about black men, you're going to have to reference this. Mm -hmm. And then hopefully get to a point where, where mm -hmm. it is actually put into practice for like practical professions, right? So of course, starting with clinicians, getting to a point where hey if you want to make if you let me say it this way we want to be able to challenge the fact that people can c continue to misdiagnose black men without any repercussions okay okay that right. makes sense yes yes absolutely yeah um let me see anything you guys want to share about where you think others should contribute to expanding the scholarship. What would you say to other black men in the wings, listening to this, uh, trying to figure out how they can help, what they can do, what directives, what suggestions would you guys have for those brothers who want to help, but aren't sure of the footing, how to get involved, what to do, what work do you think needs to be done? And what would you say to them? Hmm. We'll start with uh, Dr. Gadsden and then Dr. Harris. I thought you were going to start with Dr. Harris. That's, I had to think about it. <laughs> okay. That's a good question. I can, go, I can go first. I can go first. Um, uh, because one, I, I saw one of the comments. I uh, I hope he didn't leave, but uh, somebody was saying that the language um that that we was using. So to be clear, some of the stuff that we're talking about, that's just a a, a like, like that's just the best word to explain what we're talking about, okay. but. We are not trying to be distant from our people. My name is Hood Scout, right? I'm a hood dude, right? So um, what for me, I want to collaborate. So don't think that just because you don't have a PhD or you don't have um, particular training that your voice can't be a part of the work that we're doing. So in a very practical way, if, if, if I'm like, hey, I need you. I need you to either fill out this survey or come and speak at this event or show up in some kind of way, then be more than willing to, to speak up, right? And I feel like that's very hands-on, that's very down to earth because the goal is to have this, we don't want to have barriers, right? We don't want to, we, we don't want to be like the other academic disciplines that are so distant from our people, mm -hmm. right? 
So for a very practical um practical thing, I just say is pull up, right? Mm-hmm. Talk to us, but talk to us in such a way that when we are doing the work, let's build together, yeah. right? Because we got we can have both. Yes, we want to we want to give you your time to grieve to 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 share your uh, frustrations, and let's use that energy towards moving forward. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, I would just add to that. We need your resources. We need your time. And the resources is not just money, but that's good too. We need all resources of black men who are invested in lifting up the voice of other black men and this agenda to help us to uh, structure this so that we can have a movement that lives beyond all of us, that a legacy that lives beyond all of us. Number two, I think is important first that every one of us continue to decolonize ourselves. That's the best thing we, we can start with. Mm-hmm. That whatever that process is, therapy, groups with other black men, reading uh, a text written by black men, scholars or what have you, that you, we have to continue the personal work. I mean, I talked, to, I was reading about this today and writing about the collect, the personal unconsciousness of black men, right? the individual black man and his unconsciousness. When I say unconsciousness, I mean all of those repressed, suppressed memories, traumas versus the collective black man, right? Mm-hmm. The, you know, all of those things that we as black men, regardless of where we find ourselves geographically or intergenerationally, may all hold in terms of experiences that are part of that collective unconsciousness of black masculinity. And so I think that we have an obligation to heal, that that's the first place to really be, you know, a part of an ongoing personal and collective healing. And then to use our resources wherever you, uh, uh, whatever you have, when these opportunities come up where brothers are building to be a part of that, you know, Mm -hmm. and then lastly, whatever discipline that you're in, whether you're a teacher, whether you're a politician, whether you're a lawyer, that your work is situated in a decolonizing framework and mm-hmm. that, that you use your power and your expertise and whatever it is to uplift black men, mm-hmm. black boys. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, um, when I teach intro to Africana studies, one of the things I do is because it's such an interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary, transdisciplinary field, what I do is I give people a sampler plate of contributions to different fields by Africana studies scholars, most of whom uh, have one foot in, in Africana, one foot in whatever other field they're interested in. What I think needs to happen with uh, this research on black males is I, I'd be interested to see brothers in different fields actually begin to excavate the work of black males on both. And it, and it doesn't necessarily have to be black males initiating the work, but research on black males in other fields, in a variety of fields mm. that is accurate, that is empirically based on one level or another, even in the context of your given discipline, but begins to explain and, and make sense of black male experience from that vantage point. So if you're coming out of journalism, if you're coming out of uh, literature, if you're coming out of philosophy, if you're coming out of, you know, whatever the field is, I would be willing to bet that there is a legacy, however, no, you know, however big or small of uh, work regarding black males that has not been brought into this discussion. Because I think w- there's a moment here to pull together generations of work. I mean, this is what I've been seeing in the last decade especially with Dr. Tommy Curry's work, you're starting to see scholars that have been buried and dismissed, Mm. being excavated, pulled out. And we're saying, look at the value of what these people have been writing that hasn't been credited, hasn't been acknowledged anywhere near to the extent it needs to be. And what role it plays in what we can do with it. I mean, I just researched, I just covered, I did a show on one of Errol Miller's papers back Mm. in the 1980s. Yeah, He was talking about uh, some of the gender dynamics in Jamaica, going Mm. back to the, the 19th century and leading all the way up to the 1980s. And he was empirically defining these these practices and how it affects. And I'm blown away, mm. blown away, because I didn't run across this paper until a year ago. Yeah, And I'm saying, how much else is out there mm. that hasn't been connected to this push that we're in now? You know what I mean? Because like you guys said, they'll pull in a bell hooks. Mm. You know, we'll hear her, her, her assessments going back to the 1980s. But when you really start to look at Brothers in particular who've been making these contributions, I, I have a suspicion there's a lot more out there 
um, that needs to be drawn into this. You know, so I would hope uh, for those who are out there who are interested in trying to figure out how to get involved, we need to hear from your discipline, your, you know, what you can find within it that speaks to these same questions. And to that let's, point, and let's make clear that, um, and this is what we try to lay out in the special issue. There's a difference between just generically talking about men, mm -hmm. generically talking about black men, right. and actually studying black men in detail. Right. Because right. what happens is a lot of people say, oh, yeah, we study black men. And it's and what it is is they looked at Martin Luther King or they looked at Malcolm X or they looked at some other major figure. Mm -hmm. right? And this also gets to the point of how how usually black men are, are put into a particular mode. Mm. Right. And so in the special issue, I say black men are fathers, we're lovers, we're mm -hmm. um we're community leaders, we're mm -hmm. professors, we're teachers, we're firefighters, we're we 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 love men, we love women, we love children. We is we're all these things, mm -hmm. right? And, and and I think that the diversity of black men really gets lost in many of the conversations. Yeah, because it's like, oh, and this is what happens, right? When we want to understand black men and say black men are bad, hmm. let's look at R. Kelly. Mm -hmm. Right, 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 right. Or if we want to say black men are good. Let's look at LeBron James. Even oh, though they, wow. it's mm. like they kind of came at LeBron James recently, which is kind of yeah. weird. But but it's like, but it's always like these very like look at these people. R. Kelly is a once in a generation type singer, right? right? right LeBron right. James might be the best basketball player to ever play, mm. and these are the ones who are representing black men. We're measured, we're measured against the behavior of a fraction of a fraction of black yeah. men. Extremes, yeah. And that's considered norm. That's considered a, a norm. Yeah. yeah. So we have to, we definitely have to break that up. So, um, so, and I'm saying that so that when people start looking into the fields, mm -hmm. don't just fall into that same trap. Right. Look at the, the fact that this black men are being studied in depth. Yeah. And I would say reading this uh, journal uh, would be a, a, an excellent start if you haven't read anything else like it. Uh, to get a sense of what we're talking about in yeah. terms of how black men should be studied. And to Dr. Johnson's uh, call, you know, this is this is, this is not premature. This is uh, all working out for the good. Uh, we are, you know, thinking about doing an edited book that uh, really uh, creates a further complex, nuanced conversation around some of the the questions and the focus of our special issues. Mm. Uh, so you should be looking out for that soon. And if you're interested, uh, we're looking, as we were talking about, from multiple disciplines uh, to when you see the abstract call, you know, uh, answer it <laughs> uh, right. so that we can continue this conversation. That will be hopefully out soon once we get the publisher to say yes. Uh, we found a good uh, black focus publishing house, mm -hmm. so let's see, uh, and uh, let's let's move this conversation through action. Mm -hmm. And so, see a call, don't ignore the call. You know, answer the call so that uh, we can get this out. Yeah. Yeah. Um, any closing thoughts from both of you? Uh, anything at all you want to share before we 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 pull out? And I want to say thank you to both of you. Um, they were willing to come on and with very short notice, and I appreciate it. Um, but any closing thoughts you want to lead the audience with? I wanted to close with what we close with in our editorial on the special issue. Okay. Um, because right there, that's a very um it's detailed, it's it's practical, but it looks uh, it it provides a vision, it paints a vision of how this could actually look. So if you can pull that up. Um, I sent it to you in a private chat too. That's all about it. Let me see here. Okay, here we go. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah. And so it's the very last um, paragraph. Okay. And y'all, this is the article I'm, re I'm referencing in the chat. Um, so this is available and open to the public. If y'all want any other, um, if you if you have problems accessing any of the articles. Um, let me know. Is this what you're talking about here? The work of black male studies? Yeah. All right, cool. All right, the work of black male studies has only begun. There are some, some scholarly solutions oriented 
and Africana works that have already paved the way. Potential to bring effective change in the in the labs is that in the last I'm sorry, sorry. Right, they, yeah, in the um to make it large. I, sorry about that. No, you get it. Side panel, I can't move it. No, I got I got it. Um change, lives of black men and boys in and outside of academia is limitless. By going in the direction of becoming a transdisciplinary field, black male studies not only looks at healing black boys fighting the school to prison pipeline, black male sexuality, and so on, but it provides the framework to do all of this work together. Imagine scholarship on incarcerated black men that looks at their childhood, provides, looks at their childhood psychology, provides a sociological analysis of their city, an Africana framework of history, identity, and race, a detailed study about the school system, education they were part of, a legal analysis of the injustice system, um, partnership with black organizations that are fighting against mass incarceration, and a psychological study of their background, how they are existing in this world as black men, and the psychophysiological effects of the trauma they have experienced in life and now being in prison. This is the future of black male studies that we are hoping for. The time is now for us to develop to develop this field and create a better future for black men and boys. A better future for black men and boys will also mean a better future for black people. Our enemy is not each other. Our enemy is white supremacy. And this is we are fighting. This is what we are fighting to dismantle. Frank, much appreciated. Sure. You know, um, go ahead and take that in. All right. Uh, anything you want to say, uh, Dr. Gaston, before we close out? No, uh, just uh, thank you again for allowing us this platform. It's always a great time to talk to uh, you brothers in particular, and I'm looking forward to more expansive conversations with other uh, Black men, Black scholars, uh, and activists, and practitioners. And, you know, it is my hope that we really structure, uh, really build a movement and an initiative that not only is action oriented, but that leaves a legacy beyond us. And um, hey, we can do it. <laughs> we've got the skill set, we've got the passion, uh, and we just uh, affirm the intentionality and the focus. Indeed. All right, brothers, thank y'all for coming through. Go ahead and take you down. We we'll appreciate it. Um, please make sure you support uh, the uh, journal that just came out. It's in. Uh, wait a minute. There we go. Deconstruction and analysis, reframing and legitimizing the complexity of studying black men. That's a piece by Travis Harris. Excuse me. Um, let me see. Here we go. So the Journal of Black Sexuality and Relationships and then Deconstruction and Analysis, Reframing and Legitimizing the Complexity of Black Masculinity is the title. Um, Oshan Gadsden, Travis Harris uh, as the editors. Make sure you get hold of it if you can support it, if you will. This is the kind of work that we want to see. Uh, built in the academy that allows for black men to uh, actually expand and study uh, our experience and boys, of course, in ways that isn't conventionally supported. So please make sure you do that. Thank you for joining the Onyx Report. I will see you guys soon. And make sure that you check out the new Onyx uh, uh, Network channel. Uh, matter of fact, you can go ahead and pick that up. You can download it on Amazon Fire TV. You can do it on Roku. Um, a lot of different ways you can do it. You can download it onto your um, iPhone, onto your uh, your Android. There's a number of ways you can actually kind of engage it. So let me put this up for you to see. But that's how you can do it there. Just research, just search the Onyx Network, Media for Thinking Black Men. You don't even have to put in media. Just put in the Onyx Network and you can check it out from there. 24-7, you know, 365, the channel's there. And I am putting out work. Uh, from those who, who you know, are willing to contribute uh, to the channel. It's just getting started. We just launched it a couple weeks ago, but it is up. It is there. Uh, support it. Expand on it. Share it with people. And you can support. You can support the Onyx Network. You can support the Onyx Report here on YouTube. You can support the Institute for Black Male Studies um, as well. And if you haven't checked that out, instituteforblackmalestudies.com. I can go ahead and, and check that out, but you can support all these endeavors. You can go to Patreon, which you can see the link right there on the screen, patreon.com slash T.H. Johnson. 
And you can choose to support any of those or all of them on a monthly basis through Patreon. I appreciate the support that you guys have extended uh, up to date. And we are, let me see, I don't know if we've kind of passed it um, already, but uh, ooh, very close. So we, I'm trying to break 30,000 subscribers here on YouTube. I am currently 18 subscribers short. A lot of people have been telling me they've been unsubscribed from my channel. So uh, help us with uh, the endeavor. Let's get past 30,000, support each of the different entities I told you about, support the journal. But this is how we build. We build by supporting each other, uh, using each other as a resource and taking it a step further. So hopefully you'll do that. I appreciate the time. Appreciate y'all being here. Y'all have a good one. Peace. I am here to tell you, brothers, we are not criminals by birth, perennial rapists, incapable intellects, man children, sperm donors, child support wellsprings, success objects, walking phalluses, ATM machines, lottery tickets, unintelligent henchmen, valueless assassins, pro bono mercenaries, unpaid bodyguards, interchangeable stepfathers, child discipline proxies, unpaid repairmen, workhorses, emotional tampons, or any other socially accepted dehumanizing stereotype. We are thinkers, inventors, innovators, leaders, fathers, and men. Embrace your humanity, know your worth, and extend your time, attention, and resources only to those who genuinely respect you. And remember, your worth is not defined by meeting other people's narcissistic, selfish, and unrealistic needs. You define your worth. Peace.